<laughs> last time I gave him quite an array of accolades that I think bore a weight on his back and weighed him down. So this time I'll just say good evening, Armando. Hanok, good evening. What a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you for having me again. I'd uh, love to discuss further in these difficult times for a lot of people, and hopefully we can shed some light on a couple of tough issues that are pressing in this nation today because there's quite a bit to talk about. If you ask me, Hanok, everything from boy people trying to vandalize statues to when is there going to be some sort of uh, remedy for this? You know, the, what, what is going to be the remedy? Because the, there's a lot going on, Hanok. It's important to tackle these angles from my view, which has a little bit to do with TV, but also just as a, a regular citizen. Uh, more importantly, a migrant from Mexico, Tijuana, Baja California, which I know you are familiar with, and one day hopefully you'll visit. But thank you for having me, Hanok. I really appreciate it. No problem. But who was also born in the beautiful San Diego, California? Yes, and you were you were born here in Southern California as well. Somebody told me, and I don't know if this is true, but you and I were both born on the same day, uh, potentially uh, during the same time frame. But you and I are both November 13, 1990. Yeah, I know when I was born. I was born at 4.20 a.m. Shout out. I don't know what time you were. So, I, I mean, unless you were at like midnight or something, I'm probably a little older. You, I think you might be. I think you might be a lot older. I, who knows? You, I was born, uh, yeah. I Alexander, think. the man who knows. Why don't we start by telling the good folks. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a fan of the MC MF Doom way before I ever met you. And he goes by many aliases. One mm -hmm. of his aliases, I don't know if you know this, is the Vaudeville Villain. And so in order to understand who the villain of vaudeville is, we have to understand great characters in history like Alexander the Man Who Knows. Tell us a little bit about Alexander the Man Who Knows and what is vaudeville? Thank you very much, Hannah, for that excellent question. For those of you that may not be familiar, as a hobby, uh, I do balloon twisting, magic, uh, dabbled in ventriloquism, hypnotism, the variety arts. And one of those variety arts uh, in particular is magic. And uh, Alexander, the man who knows, was a magician, and he was very well known for being a, a divinator, so to say, a clairvoyant, uh, became very famous throughout Europe and the United States, and he came to fame predominantly before the vaudeville period. He was a little bit pre-vaudeville. Vaudeville refers to a, a variety of arts and entertainment that, for the most part, were present in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, potentially a little bit before then. Uh, Alexander, the man who knows, was close to that time frame bit a little bit before that. Uh, well-known magician among others who were in Europe, Hobsonser at the time, if you, if you want to talk magic. But overall, it was an important time period for entertainment, now much different than we are uh, living now. Imagine if this had occurred back then, like it did in 1917. How are you handling the situation? I mean, uh, this is unusual. It's like we've stepped into the twilight zone, don't you think? I think history, th there's a statement Dan Carlin quotes often attributed to the great Mark Twain, aka Samuel Clemens, that history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Mm. So it's not the exact same situation, but we had the so-called Spanish flu back then. You have yeah. World War One back then. Now you have rumors of World War Three. Don't forget, with all the madness of 2020 in January, mm -hmm. people on Twitter were making memes and jokes about a potential World War Three. And mm -hmm. I would like to go back to your vaudeville point. I think it's very important. I, I didn't realize that Alexander, the man who knows, actually predates it. That's good information. But mm -hmm. actually, vaudeville, if I'm not mistaken, also you know by having all of these random acts of entertainment together is a precursor to professional wrestling and thus a precursor to the Vale Tulo, to the No Holds Bar, to MMA and UFC, which I, I go in depth on this channel elsewhere as well. Also with people speaking in slightly humorous ways and being a part of entertainment, a precursor to stand-up comedy, which we discussed in our, our last event. And so that's why I wanted you to, to break that down to show people the linking between the martial sciences, between hip hop, between um, magic, stand-up comedy, and you, you know, you summed it up. It's all about entertainment. And the reason I said that in the face of some of the things you were talking about, I think you were referencing uh, Trump sending his secret federal troops. I forgot the name of the operation, but he's got some uh, cockamamie name for the operation, but he's sending in federal troops to Portland, to Chicago, and, and likely other cities now where he believes that the current rulers there, the mayors and the governors have been derelict in their duty and in their responsibility. 
Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting. Did you ever think you would see this day, Hanok? Did it cross your mind? Because this is unusual. The federal government almost, in, I don't know if they're in disagreement, but there's some tension. Wouldn't you say there are some people that don't want help? Isn't that interesting to you? There are folks that don't want the help for whatever reason. Why, in your opinion, why is it that they don't want help just to get better, to get uh, a little bit more healed? Because that's an interesting point. Phenomenal question. Let's first begin by saying that you you said before the pre-roll here that you want to talk about a little bit of the word of God. So let's insert the word of God here. When you read the scroll of Daniel, if you have the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text from the 800s onwards, you're looking at 12 chapters of the scroll of Daniel. If you have the OG, which is the old Greek text, you're looking at 13 chapters. Whichever way you cut it, the vast majority of those chapters, 1 to 12 in particular, 13 is about the great Susan or Susanna. Uh, 1 to 12 is primarily about Daniel being a man of God, no matter who is in charge on earth, because God is always in charge. In fact, Daniel means only God could judge or God judges me. Mm -hmm. So he's there with the Babylonians. He's there with the Persians. He doesn't care who is in charge. He doesn't care if it's President Donald Trump. He doesn't care if it's Joe Biden. He doesn't care if it's Obama or the Bushes or the Clintons. Whoever is in charge, he knows ultimately God is in charge. So he knows how he can think, speak, and behave in whatever atmosphere is there. So let's say that. That's the first point of Daniel. The second point of Daniel is that no matter how great and powerful these regimes and empires seem, each one of them has fallen. Mm. And what I would submit to you is that it's very hard to step out of your biases, but I always encourage people to do so. And that's what I try to do with my channel is to show as nuanced a perspective as possible. I've had several people ask me, what is my politics? Because I've remained elusive. So let me say this, my politics is monarchy and the king is Jesus. But given the current earthly regime that we have, my politics is that I think if we step outside of our own perspective, if we were to be an astral projection of ourselves and look at the environment, I think we'd have to say that America as an empire is in its last throes, its last waning breaths, that it's wheezing and that it's dying and it's ill and it's poisoned. So I think the, the insurrection, because that's what it is, the insurrection that has been going on is because it's gotten to a point where it is not conceivable for one ruler to rule 300 million plus people. What mm -hmm. I fear is a balkanization of the United States. And I saw Milos liking our uh, video the other day that uh, I posted of you. So we might have to get Milos on here to tell us what balkanization is as he went through it, you know, mm -hmm. right, right there in Eastern Europe there with Macedonia, which are our great friend mm -hmm. Adrian what, what is balkanization, well. by the way. I myself, I'm not quite sure. What so the it? Balkans, the Balkans are this region in Eastern Europe. You have Yugoslavia, which gets chopped up into a million different smaller countries because of internal civil war and conflict. And so the idea is that going forward, the maintenance of large empires will not be possible. And so there was a tradition in your tradition, in the Roman tradition, where they used to call anti-popes. So there's one pope, and he says he's pope, but then there are other popes, and they say they're pope. So they call them anti-popes or an alternative pope, kind of like Luigi and Wall Luigi, Mario and Wario. So this November, if Trump wins, we may see the insurrection continue and the Democrats still pick someone else. If Biden wins, we may see Trump say, I'm still in charge, and we may see two different Americas going on. We may see 10 different Americas split. So I think it's the, the number one, the signs that the American empire is coming to a collapse. I don't know what's coming next. And I think that these battles between the, the states and the federal troops are going to show ultimately at least two different Americas, potentially three, four, five Americas. Well, do you think, you know, has this been uh, a result of this pandemic or do you think this was long before this was boiling, brewing, and now it's just now coming to fruition? Has this, obviously, in, in my opinion, I would say the pandemic would probably exacerbate that. But what do you think? I mean. Well, yes, I, I think it's excellent of you to focus on the exacerbation from the pandemic. And I think that the pandemic is definitely one thing amongst many things. It's a factor. 
right? You have people cooped up in their homes. You have people getting less sunlight. You have people working out less. Man, you have people interacting less, not touching each other. Human touch is, is a great form of getting some release, some catharsis. So all of these factors, I do think, contribute to the, the general malaise of the environment mm -hmm. that we're in right now. What what do you think could be done? You you said the word healing stuck out to me, as you said before. What do you think is the way in which the mayors and governors could heal with federal troops being sent to tell them that they are not ruling properly? My thinking, Hanok, is aligned with a good word, man. I go back to the Bible because this, as you said, as we began this session here, you said, uh, I believe history does indeed rhyme. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Bible doesn't in fact have some plagues, doesn't it? And I remember we were talking briefly, we can talk about the plagues from Exodus, from Exodus well, plagues that were cast down on uh, somebody that was not doing too good. So uh, this plague is, does sound familiar. So I, the resolution to that, uh, folks, some got saved, some did not. And uh, in fact, uh, time healed most things. And I mean, once again, I think this is one of those things that just time will tell because the uncertainty, in my opinion, is high. Going back to that, I mean, can you share, I know you're a lot more well-versed about Bible uh, happenings. Can you share a little bit about how the plagues happened in uh, in the Bible there, please, Hanno? Yeah, I mean, pretty much you're talking about, I think, the, the 10 plagues or whatever that, that besiege Egypt. The main idea there you is that, yes, the main idea there, uh, which is a table servant or a waiter, the, the main idea is that the people of Israel were told they were going to be freed and then the person who was in charge the ruler again the rulers are always shifting it's this time pharaoh who has some sort of relation is like the stepbrother of moses leading them changes his mind and eventually hardens his heart which means he he stops thinking that he can change he stops having a mindset where his mind could be changed and he begins to be stubborn and he thinks that he is God and that his godliness is superior to the God of Israel. And so really it's a battle of the gods. And we know who, who won in that arrangement. But speaking of Egypt, why don't you tell us about your time in Egypt? Because the first video on this channel is actually me following you around in Santa Monica while we're on bicicletas. And I'm asking you about your trip then. I want to see a few years out. What's your take on Egypt? I got to tell you, it's one of my favorite destinations. If anybody out there has not yet been to Egypt after this whole thing, after this whole episode has passed and it is safe uh, to go back to Egypt, I believe Egypt may be open. Please do yourself a favor, visit Egypt, reconnect with uh, that fertile land. Uh, besides simply going to Cairo and seeing the Great Pyramids, there's a lot more to see. You can go down to Aswan, check out a couple of more temples. And then further south of Aswan is my personal favorite destination. It's Abu Simbel, which is the Temple of Ramses. Uh, interestingly enough, that was actually completely moved by a team of archaeologists that had to move, be moved from location. They dismembered each single rock from that particular temple, then reassembled it. So they basically deconstructed they, it. They armando it? They, yeah, exactly right. My name, uh, Armando, means building in Spanish. Anyway, feat of archaeological uh, magic, really, if you will, and uh, ultimately a phenomenal temple that dates back to 4,000 years. If you guys have ever been on the Disneyland Jumanji or the uh, Indiana Jones ride, it does look very much like the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland. I mean, it's pretty incredible. And uh, Luxor is wonderful to see as well. I spent there in total 10 days, Hanok, and I learned a lot about it. I did think about the Bible very often over there, the Exodus, uh, of course, the plagues. And more importantly, I just got to check out the, one of the earliest places of civilization, I would say. And some do say that civilization started in uh, nearby there, Mesopotamia, if I'm not mistaken, between the two rivers, uh, Euphrates, Tigris, and of course, there's the main Nile, but that's a little bit further west, if I'm not mistaken. Overall, a great time, Henok, and uh, I would highly recommend it, but I know you know uh, Africa pretty well, don't you? Yeah, the Nile begins in Ethiopia, so uh, they, yeah. they've been surviving off our water for a while, and this week we, we dammed the Nile up, so mm -hmm. we'll see how the relations go. Hopefully, there's no war there. But uh, we'll see how all of that goes. And it's so fascinating. There's so many movies, so many productions that have been built about Egypt over time, which I think is a, a great segue to ask you, what, what has it been like working in production the past few years? I know you began with, with sports. Mm -hmm. Did you know about the sports before you began working them? And, and which sports were you working with? Thank you, Hanok. I'll tell you briefly how uh, I studied, as you know, television. 
division at, uh, at Pepperdine University. And then I got an internship my second to last year, my junior year going into my senior year. I got an internship at BBC Worldwide Productions. Uh, they do a couple of uh, shows. Most notably, they do Dancing with the Stars on ABC, which is 12 seasons in. It, it does very well for them. So I got to intern for them. And at the same time, Fox Deportes, Fox Sports in Spanish. Uh, I, you know how you begin? You begin logging. And uh, logging means you're simply watching the sport. I, I would watch a lot of soccer and writing every play down. And, and uh, wow. when you're, yeah, so you, you watch a lot of soccer. It was an internship, so I got paid a, a little bit of money, but I did get paid for, for doing that job. But more importantly, I enjoyed it. And you get to check out yeah. the environment. You know, once you log a play, you give it to the editor. Um, after you're a logger, you then begin editing highlights. And believe it or not, a lot of television, and there is a formula to it, whether it be episodic television, there's highlights, there's sports really. It all boils down to a little bit of a formula that is uh, underneath there. So it, when you do edit, you do notice that um, formula for cutting the highlights itself pretty formulaic but ultimately the best part about that is that you get to see all the other roles because there's a lot more involved in making television happen certainly we see two folks there in front of the camera but behind that there's as it's well known there's a big team there that what's editing putting on the graphics how many how many people would you say are in there on any given production it could be anywhere from 10 plus i mean it's it's countless people it depends on the size of the production the budget and of course in sports there's a lot more than, than just 10 sometimes there's hundreds when it's a major golf tournament or a tennis uh, tournament uh they're nascar you're talking hundreds of people that's why this pandemic is so interesting you know, because never i didn't think this was possible to be did you honestly think you this i mean certainly anything's possible but this is just so on you what were you where were you right before this pandemic started if you would please Henry. i was working at a charter in watts california the beautiful watts california mm -hmm. historically downtrodden home of the og watts la riots not to be confused with the old greek i mentioned earlier and i was working at a charter school an interesting position as an in-house substitute teacher just a month prior to that i was working as with an organization that was a third party contractor so i was kind of like a, a gunslingsman i was a mercenary working at all sorts of schools whether they be district or charter and i had no health insurance and i was just all by myself and had the pandemic hit then I would have been really short on cash and mm -hmm. really been behind on payments. But within a month I, of me getting this new job with this charter school, I get insurance, I get steady pay. When we begin um, closing down the schools, we begin virtual or what's called remote learning. So now I have on my resume a remote teaching experience. I have tutored children through video chat which is it's not as easy as it sounds i've created curriculum google videos and stuff on my own and so you know it benefited me to get used to better technology like this to be honest i didn't buy this till after but that's because i had experience without this mic of what the audio quality was in my video am i touching my face in the video am i breathing heavy am i knocking anything that makes any sound so i've become hyper aware and and gained these these kind of soft skills or unexpected skills of i guess audio production you could say not quite audio engineering because i don't mess with the files really after i have done it um usually take a raw cut and just upload whatever i have but mm -hmm. yeah no i didn't i didn't see it coming for this long but as soon as i heard what was going on like the plague you know what i mean it, it's in the bible but it's also in in history and it's one of those things you know like it comes every so often it's not every generation that gets a plague but you know you hear about it it's always within living memory in my parents generation the spanish flu they didn't even know what is that in ethiopia they call it yehadar bashta which mm. means the disease of november and you mm. know that's our our birth month so you know my parents growing up they didn't quite know what it meant until now and when people started relaying oh that's what that was but it's in the living memory of the people through the griot the the sort of african narrative and formula preserver as you mentioned there's a formulaic nature to the work that you do in production and actually that's that's a beautiful lens i didn't realize 
there was so much narrative in production in, in the sports realm, obviously in terms of organized television programs, I, I knew that like, like dramas and comedies and rom-coms and all that. I, I, I could understand that. I didn't realize that for sports. So what's interesting about that is that very lens of narrative is what will help you understand the Bible better, which is in my opinion, the ultimate book to understanding humankind in general. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, the solution lies in those pages, no doubt. I wanted to ask you, Hannah, because you, you bring up a very interesting point. You have been on both sides of this issue here for education. You've educated somebody both. You've tutored them via this digital domain as well as in person. What is your take? Is you And you've seen the, the logistics of it. You've seen how it works. D is that in-person interaction essential for learning? In my opinion, it is. I mean, there's no doubt that you, you need to be there. You need to have the physical contact with the teacher. It's, uh, it's helpful to be the camaraderie with the students. I mean, it's essential. What do you think being, uh, both you being a teacher in this time? Yeah, the, the video is good as a backup, mm -hmm. especially if someone you know is like diseased. It's great. Mm -hmm. Having video content pre-recorded is great as a supplement there is no replacement to face to face oh, i say this as yeah. a mediator as an arbitrator as a deacon mm -hmm. as a fighter there's nothing that replaces face to face it's it's there's nothing like it it they've you know i've heard numbers as high as 70 percent of communication is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. if that's the case some some of that 70 percent is taken care of by the video mm -hmm. but not all of it there's, there's just like, you don't see half my body right now. Half my body is communicating at you and you don't even know what it's saying. So, the, so you know what I mean? So what I got to tell you is I think we're going to see the education bubble burst. And I say education, what I really mean is schooling because we get a lot more schooling, which is the process than the education, which is the alleged interest and goal. I think what we're going to see is something Corey DeAngelis is talking about a lot. He actually was on Fox recently, and I believe the president saw him because the president made a statement today that shocked me. The statement he made was, if your kid's school is not going to open up, then those funds deserve to go directly to the families. Mm. And this is an interesting move because – it's a move that could win him the election. It's a move that seems more progressive if you think about it. Mm -hmm. If you're attached to the unions and if you're at public schools as opposed to public education and you have a narrow idea of what that means, then you will freak out at his statement. Mm -hmm. But if you are an actual parent who is afraid of catching the disease but also cannot handle the remote learning and is low on funds, if you can use the funds that are already assigned to you to the state, instead of them going into an empty public school, that's not going to be open for another year. If you could use those funds to hire someone like me to come into your home and you could group with five to 10 other people and maybe have a superior education because the teacher to student ratio is better. I think you're going to like the president a lot more and you're going to like school choice a lot more. Let me ask you this. If you were a father right now, what would you do with your children? If I would, my that's a very good question. Number one, I would ask my wife what I what I do with my children. But I would, you know, I once again believe that it's important to be out there, be active, be social, be try to uh, regain as much normalcy while being safe. Keep regaining normalcy while being safe. I do believe there's going to be some hygiene changes. I primarily think that this is a hygiene situation. You know, there are there are a lot mm -hmm. of instances where we were seeing things that should not be happening in restaurants. Uh, the hygiene level was not where it was. And so I think we are going to see some significant hygiene reforms. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, you never know. But one thing. Let's that talk I about hygiene. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no go ahead, please. Hannah. Yes. Por favor. Yeah. Well, no, I, for instance, I'll tell you, I am glad to see that in the restaurant environment, more people, more of the people that are making the food are wearing a mask. I do like that uh, aspect. And honestly, the, the mask could be helpful in some situations where there's dust. There's It's handy to have one just you, if you're going into a not great a maybe restaurant or an environment so if mm -hmm. or if you need to rob a bank after your shift 
Do you relate with that statement, Henok? What do you think? I mean, is this was this a hygiene situation? Yeah, I like the idea of hygiene. What I wanted to focus on is I know that you are a man who loves face-to-face -face communication, and one of the great signs of face-to-face -face communication and contractual obligation and pleasure and all of the above is the handshake. It's something that's been trusted for many centuries. I know people have many variations. They try to fist, they try to jellyfish, they try to San Francisco shuffle, they try so many different things. But I know you're a fan of the classic tried and true Lindy, we would say in the real world Risk Institute part of Twitter, the Nassim Nicholas Taleb crowd. And uh, so this Lindy technique, this handshake, what's going to become of it? I've heard people saying that the handshake may be abolished and I wanted to get your take. I'm a firm believer that it's going to come to the Chinese bow. I, in fact, I've, I've started myself doing implementing it already. Stay, keep a distance. I'll give you a nice little nod, a little bow instead of a handshake. I'm, I'm all for that. If, if there's been some detection of something not right with that handshake, no problem in changing that. I mean, that, that will be a change of a, of, of a severe magnitude, but I think if it's, for the safety of everybody, I think why not change that up and why not bring back the the Asian bow, which I think is might be even more respectful if you ask me. That could show more reverence. Uh, now, what is the origin of the handshake? Are you familiar with that? Because I believe it goes back to fencing. Or, or uh, what is the history of the handshake? Tell me about it. Well, no, that's why I'm asking you. I believe it goes back to the, when people were fencing, when people were were doing some uh, combat with with their weapons. They wanted to use a free hand or a, a hand that did not have a weapon up into say hey listen i come in peace in my opinion i believe that's what it is so hey listen times are changing it's a 21st century hanok and that and currency is also changing we're seeing a coin shortage what do you make of that hanok did you ever this is another thing i went i bought a coffee today i went to uh, dunkin donuts here just down the street mm -hmm. the guy says to me that uh, the gentleman there the cashier register says please we don't have coins can you pay with a card or uh, exact change never yeah. thought it would happen but is this pointing to something is there uh monetary reform on the horizon. What do you think is, uh, is happening? That? Yeah, so what I always desire is what F.A. Hayek, the 1974 or 1973 Nobel Prize winner of economics, the Austrian economist who was, uh, if I'm going to be honest in assessing him, a little soft. But what he used to say that was really good is he wanted to have a decriminalization of alternative currencies. The last president to suggest an alternative to the dollar were to introduce the silver backed an actual precious metals backed dollar as opposed to a fiat currency was shot in the head in dallas that was john f kennedy Good so uh, whether you believe in the conspiracy theories or not that's the last person who really got to suggest that tricky mm -hmm. dick nixon took us off of the gold standard for sure all uh, which fdr began in the 30s with his confiscation of gold mm -hmm. so i say this uh you know to, uh, I'm preaching to the choir. I know you like to sell gold and silver. But <laughs> what I think is that something that Peter Schiff has been talking about famously on the Joe Rogan experience recently and elsewhere on on Twitter and his own YouTube channel, sometimes with five-hour videos. It's impressive. you got to check him out, Peter Schiff. But the basic idea is that the solvency of the U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve note, is – going away the purchasing power is going away i went to carl's jr the other day and my meal was 15 dollars, which used to be like 10 dollars. so you know what i mean i i've seen i've seen the prices increase in and out what used to be five dollars is like nine or ten dollars now i've oh. seen things go up my parents have reported their groceries have gone up from 100 150 dollars to about 200 dollars you know, oh, what? every time yeah so I've, I've seen the purchasing power of the dollar goes out part of that is the twelve hundred dollars they sent out to everybody part of that is the 800 a week during the month of july that they're also sending out to people it's debasing the value of the federal reserve note and what's going to happen is hyperinflation like we saw in the weimar republic germany or like we saw in zimbabwe just a few years ago what the weimar republic did was you know they had ruins and it eventually led to you know the nightmare of, of World War II, what the uh, where they had to steal resources from other people because their situation was going to be so horrible. And uh, of course, they had some maniacs there too. But what happened with Zimbabwe is they just abolished their currency and adopted other currencies. They said, we're not going to use it. But you can't always do that. And what that might mean is that the reserve currency of the world might become the Chinese yen, or I don't know what the Russian currency is, the Russian currency, because 
our solvency is going away. They're either going to have to allow us to, they're either going to decriminalize alternative currencies within the United States, which could save us, um, or take us back to a currency based in actual precious metals, mm. um, where you can exchange your Federal Reserve note for actual worth goods in person at a vault somewhere where they where they keep a physical amount. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be in trouble, man. We're going to be in trouble. There's going to be even more pandemonium like yeah. you're seeing in Portland. Oh. Let me ask you this. How open would you be to using alternative currencies? And have you ever invested in alternative currencies? Listen, I did invest. If you're referring to the cryptocurrencies, I, I have a, a small experience. I know Bitcoin got very popular. I, I got into the game late very late so much so that i tell you i didn't do too well i did a litecoin for a little bit ethereum uh and certainly i mean hey listen if at the end of the day it's something that we're going to assign value to something that's going to allow me to get my other goods to trade to barter shoot man let it uh we we will we need to ad adapt don't you think i mean it becomes a question of adaptation to a new currency uh the Agreed. Whole, how do you prepare for something like that you mentioned a couple of routes whether it be going back to gold or silver standard some are saying there could be an introduction of a new currency, Hanok, in terms of the, the United States cryptocurrency, something along the blockchain type thing. What do you, is that a possibility or, and really, I mean, is I invested in crypto early, mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily believe in it dogmatically. Mm. I think it's very interesting. And the fact that it's in the internet is very capable, but from an Austrian economics perspective, I've always been curious about and s skeptical of the fact that it's not based in anything it's kind of a decentralized fiat currency and uh so that's you know that's that's a little scarier and a little more volatile to me mm -hmm. i i do tend to to trust history a, a little more in in that sense i'm more conservative and so i think there's something to gold and, and silver and so because you sell it, I have to ask, do you do you consider it a currency or do you just consider it an investment? I consider it both. I consider it both an investment of currency, uh, whatever you like. I mean, a piece of jewelry. Some people consider it a piece of jewelry. You know, you can you can use it for your teeth. Uh, you can have a dental cavity tap or a, a, a golden tooth, whatever you like. I mean, the thing that you want to consider, though, is. Um, what is the price really and what is the quality of the gold that you're getting? You want to make sure you're getting the real thing. So you got to be, uh, watch out for, for shady characters or the fakes, if you know what I mean. I don't, but, uh, listen, this is, it's an interesting topic. I mean, you got to be prepared. There, there's a certain stimulus right now. There's a stimulus around that's, uh, in question. And it's, it's once again in the trillions of dollars. And did you ever think that you'd be tossing around that term so easily trillions? Think about this one trillion dollars for just to remind everybody is $1,000 billion. If, if I'm not mistaken, is that right? I mean, even now I'm thinking that yeah, it makes Dr. Yeah. Evil look yeah. modest in his villainous requests from yeah. Austin Powers, the spy <laughs> who shagged me. Yeah, and <laughs> I know you're a fan. And and one billion is, is 1,000 million. I mean, it's quite a bit, so it's it's, it's hard to imagine what that's going to do. So, you're right. I mean, it's interesting topic now. Is it going to benefit the schools? That's what I really want to know. Going back to academia and going back to uh, the young. What do you, what 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 do you mean by benefit the schools? I mean, are they going to get more of a stimulus around because more of this is being made available to them? More resources, in theory, are being created as this is going on. And uh, yes, but as I said, the schools may no longer exist. If this is the new paradigm, we may see going forward the whole idea that you can have a five hundred person mm -hmm. or one thousand person school is an idea of scale that perhaps was artificially propped up. And what the pandemic is revealing are the fakes and the phonies from the those that are the truth. And those that are the truth are the ones who are gonna be the least fragile, the most anti-fragile, the most resistant, and in fact, the ones who have the greatest ability to grow through chaos and disorder. And I think that we're, we're gonna have to scale down our cities, our metropolitan areas, we're going to have to scale down our universities. We're going to have to scale down our government. We're going to have to scale down the police. We're going to have to scale down education. Everything's going to be scaled down. I think everything was artificially propped up. And now we're going to see them crash and we're going to see a diverse amount of everything. But a lot of it is going to be more localized. And so depending on what you mean by the schools, you know what I mean? I think the schools as we know them, 
may also be in their in their last throes before their their death or their bubble bursting. My gosh, yeah. So there's no doubt. But that might be the greatest thing. Joseph Schumpeter, another Austrian economist, although he strayed from the path a little bit, he used to call this cycle of the economy creation and destruction. I want to recall one company for you, and then I want to get your quick reaction. When I say Blockbuster, what do you think of? When I say Blockbuster? Yes. Or when you say Blockbuster? When I say Blockbuster, what do you think of? When I'm talking about the video company that you and I grew up on. I, I remember going into a Blockbuster. It was always a pleasant experience for me. I do remember uh, in many ways an experience being taken away when the store went away. I think of going in there, choosing a DVD, making it a little bit of an event. Now I think of Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, and uh, taking the game to another level where you can just uh, select it right from the comfort of your family living room. So I think of a- So Blockbuster is gone. Yeah. It's been destroyed. Mm -hmm. But what has been created are all the alternatives that you've just said. Mm -hmm. How about Borders? Did you ever go to Borders growing up? My pops used to uh, drop me off there. Yeah, I did. I remember that. And Barnes and Noble. Remember Barnes and Noble? Barnes and Noble is still around. Yeah. Barnes and Noble is good. Yeah, I mean, and Amazon, Amazon, who mostly led to that, actually has some brick and mortar shops. I don't know if you've seen the one in uh, Marina del Rey, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, there's one in Century City as well here in Los Angeles. The the Amazon bookstore there at the Century City Mall. Outstanding. There's no doubt things are changing. I know. Now I want to. Things ask, are not just changing; they're being destroyed, and things are being created. In death, there is rebirth. Some say, going back to Egypt and visiting the Egyptian land. Isn't that a an Egyptian saying, potentially, or a biblical saying? And death, there. It could be. It sounds like the phoenix. I mean, it sounds like Jesus, who died and was resurrected. Don't you think? Yeah, the resurrection <laughs> is beautiful, just like the resurrection in Monopoly that we talked about the other day, as well as the resurrection in chess. That is true. That is true. Listen, I want to ask you, speaking of change, uh, in terms of sports, sports are beginning. MLB kicks off today. Uh, mm -hmm. UFC, I know, has been having a couple of the bouts on the weekends. What are the changes that's going to come? Because this uh, situation, this biological threat is affecting everything from the production to how the sports are played. MLB, for instance, has a couple of new rules. No spitting. People, it seems like the players can't spit, maybe not even eat seeds. And the other that's thing, tough. yeah, and then the other thing they can't, uh, argue within six feet of each other. Uh, a couple of the rules have been added to the game, and uh, we can get a little bit more specific about that. But what do you think is going to be some changes that we're going to see in sports? And are they going to? There's no more contact sport than the UFC, and yeah. so there's certain things they can't change. You know what I mean? They're they're still going to be exchanging sweat, blood, and tears. What they have been is they've been testing the shit out of them before and after, and we've had some main events. Um, changed because fighters had to get pulled out certain coaches had to not be there too so imagine your coach not being there on the chance that you're fighting for the championship we, we saw that with jorge masvidal mm -hmm. you know um it's it's tough we saw durinho get pulled out because he he caught it we saw uh jacare get pulled out because he got it you know it's uh people getting pulled out and just event cards getting rearranged if you want to bring it back to the bible in the book of James or the book of Jacob, it says that don't say that you're going to do anything in the future without saying God willing or if the Lord wills, because you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I remember we closed down the schools March 13th and it was Friday the 13th and people tried to draw their superstitious um, thoughts and philosophies and ideologies around that, whether or not that's true. What I remember is, you know, had you woken up March 12th, you did not necessarily know March 13th. And if you knew March 12th, you did not necessarily know March 11th that this mm -hmm. was going to happen. And so I think it's going to make us all more humble. I think part of empire and largesse is a, an arrogance and a hubris that perhaps the Lord is deflating right now to mm -hmm. make us more humble one of the original meanings of the word humble is lowly. So you're closer to the earth where brother Dr. Cornell West always reminds us we will return one day and be food for our brothers, the terrestrial worms. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate it. And sticking to the Bible there, because there's a, several episodes in the Bible handle where people, characters get humbled. And I can think of specifically Job, the man who gets tested many, many times, but yet still maintains his faith. Do you mind, as a deacon, share with us that uh, phenomenal story of uh, Job? 
Yeah, in fact, I will. I do not mind. And in fact, I'm going to treat you to some goods. My grandmother passed away almost a year ago now, about last September. And the last two years of her life, she kept quoting the book of Job to me in goods. She would say, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away blessed be the name of the lord there so that's go. what she used to repeatedly quote to me so job makes that statement when he loses his wife when he loses his children when he loses his animals when he loses his house and in the end he is rewarded with twofold of everything but whether or not he was rewarded it's important to remember the words of the three youth anania azaria and misael who are in chapter three of the scroll of Daniel we mentioned earlier. And Nebuchadnezzar gets them, he, he wants them to bow down to this golden statue, which represents him, to worship it. And they say no. And he says, well, then I'm going to throw you into this blazing fire and I'm going to cook you alive. And, he, and they say, we are not going to bow down to that golden statue of yours. And if you put us in that fire, our God can save us. But even if he does not save us, we still will not bow down. So they're going to be obedient no matter what the consequences are. They're not interested in consequences. Consequences do not guide their behavior. They have a law that is above consequence. They have a sense of indignance, of righteous anger, which is the righteous anger of God, which would not let them bow down to it. So they get thrown into the fire and the archangel Gabriel is sent by the Lord and he saves them from the fire. Oh my God. So that was very impressive. And Nebuchadnezzar then gives great praise to God in that moment. So I bring that up to say tomorrow is not promised. And whether it comes or not, we need to be obedient to the Lord and to his voice that we can find in scripture, which is why I continually sow the seed with my Tawahedo Bible study podcast. My gosh, and it is fantastic. It's a, a light shining handbook in, in these tough and uncertain times that uh, are so important to remember that this story could be found in the wonderful scripture and the, the good word, the good book. Uh, the, the first five books, really, the, the Exodus and uh, several others, the, the Pentateuch, as you know very well. One other quick story about, in the same vein, a little bit different, is the story of Noah, I know, who, who gets tested, man, he gets tested. There's a, It's very famous. Of course, there's a big uh, storm, so to say, and he and several others get saved. I'm curious, why did he get saved? Was there something, I'm not too familiar with the story, I just know that he gets a calling, somebody tells him to build an ark. How does that exactly play out for those of us that may not be so familiar with the, the He story? listens to God. He's in a lawless time. God resents and regrets that he created humankind. He says he's going to wipe them out, but then he says he's going to preserve a remnant. The remnant all comes from the line of Noah. So it's Noah, his wife, and his children. And so he's, he's obediently making this ark, which in the Hebrew, as I've told you before, is the same word as the basket which Moses was found in as a baby when he was slid down the river. It's the very same word. And so um, the idea is that people are getting saved by God through water, which they fear, which they have various gods of like Poseidon and Neptune and whatever the Canaanite equivalents of Poseidon and Neptune are, because those are the Greek and Roman versions. So he's showing that God is in control over all the elements, no matter what, whether you see a tsunami, a flood, whether you're in the open sea, whether you believe there are sea monsters or not, the Kraken, right? We have a new NHL team going back to sports in Seattle, and it's named they're named the Krakens. So <laughs> the Kraken is uh, also owned by God as well to keep it relevant to the sports world that we were just talking about. So that, that's it. But I actually want to turn it on you and ask you because you are one of the most impressive people in that you get on my show and interview me. But I think we need to get a, a little bit more of, of your hot takes. I want sure. you to know, I want to know what you think of Kanye West's chances in relation to Joe Biden and Trump and all of them heading into 
uh, this fall. And I don't know if you've looked at the libertarian candidate. Her name is Joe Jorgensen. Mm -hmm. Joe Jorgensen. Wow, man. That is, I, you know what? I do like what he's doing. So you got to change it up. I think why not spice it up a little bit? It just shows really what politics to some may be. Some, some say it's simply entertainment, you know, politics. We've seen, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger become governor of California, uh, an actor, a movie star. Ronald Reagan, an actor and a movie star. Some some say that it does take that entertainer's mentality uh, to to be good in politics. So we've seen it time and time again. Kanye may have it, man. He may have the talent to succeed. We've seen it in several other places. Manny Pacquiao, famous boxer. Manny Pacquiao became a, a public politician in the Philippines, I believe, from his hometown. Uh, so it's not unheard of that these politicians uh, come from an entertainment background. Our own sitting leader comes from a, a little bit of an entertainment background, if we think to his early days on uh, television, on NBC, The Apprentice, the great show uh, back then, of course, and still now, even if you go back to season one of The Apprentice, you can see quite a bit of uh, uh, our president before he became a president. So I believe if there's a shot, uh, he, he should take it. Why not? And uh, are his chances great or small? Geez, man, it's unpredictable. You saw in the last election, the polls, it's hard to tell. You think somebody's going to win and all- They were wrong, yeah. You, then they had selection biases. They had all these things. There's all these things you never know. That's why this election could be, hopefully, you know, you never know if there's going to be a surprise or not or, or which way the surprise is going to go. There, that, that is for sure. What do you really quickly, going back to the, you, you got me thinking about politics a little bit. What do you, what do you make of this mail imbalance? What is, is it, is it, should we do it? Do you think we should go all digital with the technology? What is your take on that situation? Is it even a, a topic that should be talked about? What, what do you think? I say that my take is, I no longer really believe in democracy. And so <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was the hot take you were looking for. Yeah, good. So uh, I don't have a real dog in the race anymore. But what I can say is if you are to have democracy, it should be maximal and it should be maximally easy. You should be able to vote online if you can. There are issues with that, but I think we have people smart enough to take care of that. We have 2 million people incarcerated. If anyone's voting, all the people who are incarcerated should be voting. Mm -hmm. Just because wow. you're a felon does not mean that your voting right should be taken away. So if there is voting, I believe that everyone should be able to vote or, you know, I mean, who's eligible. I don't believe in making these arbitrary categories. You know, it's like making a three fifths person again. That's what you're doing. The, everybody knows after the 13th documentary and after Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, that the prison industrial complex, the PIC, as it's known in abolitionist circles, is made to replace slavery. You have all of these free blacks after slavery and the people couldn't stand it. So they said, let's construct a system in which we can make them slaves again on the books. So that's the, the 13th Amendment. In any event, I said something about democracy. I want to quote the great H.L. Mencken. In mm. his On Politics, A Carnival of Boncom, he says, as democracy is perfected, the office of president represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. On some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. My gosh, goodness gracious. Holy smokes. Yeah, I mean, these are uncertain times. You know, if there's anything like this, we, we need to prepare for uh, hopefully a little bit more stability coming up here. But no doubt this biological threat, really, something that who knows if it could have been prevented, really. But it's certainly difficult for, for everybody and for a lot of people. One last question here, because there have been some positive things. For instance, I learned how to juggle with this extra time just here i learned how to juggle a little bit it's a very happy to do that uh, yeah so there have knives been... knives or swords or balls or tangerines what do you do three balls three balls three little balls of, to juggle so i did learn how to juggle thank goodness it's been so there has been some positive what what if, i'm curious to know have there been some positive things that have come up from this for you or... yeah well first i dabble in in juggling as well I don't know if you'd know that or if you'd seen me juggle before, but I'm a little better at one hand, two, one, uh, one hand, two balls. I'm better at, but I can do, I can do three balls, two hands. Fantastic. Not too bad. If you add a fourth, it'll be messy. But okay. on any given day, I could bang out 20 easily and I should be able to work up to 50 or 60 reps if you, if you give me a little time. Of juggling so, or what? Of juggling. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of juggling. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I just wanted to match with you 
in regards to juggling. Oh, absolutely. but uh, yeah. Sorry, what was the question? I'm curious what positive things have come from. Oh yeah, yeah. So this podcast, right? This the philosophy of art and science. I've got what 29 episodes of this now, including this one. I've got 40 plus episodes of the Tawahedo Bible study. I'm about 11 or 12 pages in out of 100 in translating my grandfather's memoir into English. I am. Uh, I got a contract awarded to do an audio book of a Greek version of the Bible that I really appreciate. Um, I have my Bishop's book that I was I was tasked with translating to. Uh, that's another project down the line. So all this stuff, and I, I've been reading books too. So and been at home. Uh, I've been working out with my kettlebells. Uh, but it's it's crazy, man. I haven't strangled a man in like four months, so I miss jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to resume that anytime? What, what are they saying? Hopefully, are these man? That's got to be the last thing that they resume. I mean, that's the that's the most that's the most plague spreading activity. <laughs> man to man physical combat, my gosh! Man to man physical combat, and you switch partners like six times. Yeah, wow! That and is... you're in tight quarters. You're exchanging yeah. blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> Uh, the octagon. What if, have you ever been inside an octagon, by the way? Really quickly. Just... No, but I can't wait to be there one day, and I hope you'll be by my side as okay. my mental coach. What if I got prepared and got in there with you? I mean, I could probably remember. We had one or two bouts back in the day, you and I had them. Uh, oh, yeah, how did they go? Not too well for me, man. I'll tell you, you were <laughs> a bit more skilled. I think I may have put up a fight or two uh, once or twice, but uh, I remember. I think you I... did get better against my roommate. Well, <laughs> So, you know, sometimes it's, it, you, you got to let out a little bit of aggression, as they say. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful release, so to say. And okay, it's, it's, I, I'm, a, I'm a primitivist and a technologist. I definitely believe in that. I think it's a healthy, a healthy expression of masculinity when another man and a man get together and practice submission, grappling, or striking. Exactly. exactly. It's 8.30. I got to run. I think we've been out here for like 50 minutes or something like that. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Henok, as always, for having me. It's Thank you. I just have one final question yeah. for you, Armando. Yeah. If you were president, what three things would you do? Well, I would open things up immediately, number one. Right now, you mean, or just in general? Yeah, right now. Yeah, I would uh, open things up immediately, probably remove uh, the face masks and uh, increase a little bit more of... Uh, uh, get-togethers and just open everything up increase <laughs> yeah but that would that's I, I think we need do need to go back to normal a little bit uh, so that's what i would do personally but it's just a, a humble opinion i know it's very dangerous out there but sometimes you got to take a couple of risks but you got to be safe so it's a tough question Hanno, but that's what it probably what comes to mind first really uh i mean thank you sir yeah <laughs> thank have you. a good evening thank you you too be well